Okay, can everyone see the the presentation? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, so we will uh, discuss two concepts today. Uh, well, one one is uh, well, I guess both are sort of concepts. Uh, we will start with the molecular dating, um, and uh, we will discuss something called uh, species trees. Um, this is something. Uh, this is a completely new way of uh, looking at phylogenies, which is gaining a lot of traction in uh, recent times. Um, now, let's start with molecular dating. And yesterday's uh, biogeography uh, theory, as, as well as uh, the practicals, you must have realized that uh, you know a dated phylogeny is is extremely uh, useful. Uh, actually, it is not just useful for biogeography. It is also useful for you know other methods like uh, uh, character evolution, and uh, so it has lots of other applications also. So, what is uh, molecular dating, or what is a dated phylogeny? We also call it a time tree uh, nowadays. Basically, it is where molecular uh, dating is uh, is about combining. Uh, fossil and geological records, information from fossil and geological records with analysis of molecular data to estimate the ages of ancestral nodes, right? So we want to find out when these speciation events took place. Uh, from the tree, we know that, okay, this speciation event here that resulted in humans and chimps as the descendant uh, lineages occurred recently, well, more recently than this speciation event. But we don't know the absolute time when it occurred, right? So molecular dating is actually trying to get to that. Now, the whole uh, idea of molecular dating uh, comes from the molecular clock hypothesis. And this was uh, proposed in the early 60s by uh, Zucker, Kendall, and Pauling. And what they noticed was that uh, when they compared amino acid uh, protein sequences, basically amino acid differences in hemoglobin protein uh, between different species, uh, they realized that the number of differences was uh, linear, linearly uh, correlated with the time when these uh, uh, species had diverged from each other, right? So, for example, if they looked at species that had diverged, so on, on x-axis is age in million years and y-axis is amino acid difference. So, if they compared two species that had diverged from each other say 10 million years ago and compared their amino acid uh, the difference in their uh, uh, the the amino acid the, the protein sequence the number of amino acids between them and then so on and then you keep comparing species uh, pairs that have diverged at different time periods you realize that as more and more time elapses the number of differences between species in the protein sequence increases. And this is not a big surprise because with time, mutations accumulate. And uh, uh, with as more time elapses, more changes accrue between a species pair, right? Uh, but what was interesting was this relationship that they found was linear, right? Um, now we know that it's not exactly linear. There are other issues, but uh, we can, if we have time, we can get to that. Uh, but basically, this meant that we can use amino acid difference, differences between species to date when they diverge from each other, right? So, so that's the whole idea of, of using molecular data to date uh, uh, divergent events. Now, that was an empirical observation that Zucker, Candle, and Pauling made uh, in the early 60s. 
Uh, by late 60s, uh, uh, Motu Kimura from Japan uh, came up with a neutral theory of molecular evolution, uh, which gave the empirical, uh, which gave the theoretical background uh, or the uh, sort of the theoretical underpinning for the molecular clock hypothesis. So the molecular clock hypothesis basically says that you know genes evolve at the same rate across lineages, right? And that would basically then mean that. Uh, the amount of molecular change between two species is a measure of how long ago they shared a common ancestor, right? So in this case, you have species S1 and S2. It has two changes, and that means it has diverged at a certain point in time in the past. If you look at S3 and S4, there are more number of changes, so probably they diverge from each other further back in time. So that is the very, very simple uh, uh, idea here. But there are complications, and we'll come to that. Now, um, how do we? So the, the, the point really is, once we know the rate of molecular evolution, we can then use that data to infer when you know, species have diverged from each other. Uh, but to determine the rate of molecular evolution, one has to, to calibrate the molecular clock. And how do we do that? Uh, one can, again, we go back to our example where you have species S1 and S2. If you know of a fossil that represents the common ancestor of S1 and S2, and if you know the age, of that fossil. In this case, the age of this fossil is 5 million years. So it was, um, it existed 5 million years ago. Uh, and we know the divergence between these two species. Uh, so the rate then becomes, uh, uh, per species pair, becomes the, the divergence divided by time. It's as simple as that. So that is your rate of molecular evolution. And for a particular gene, if you compare these two species, if there are 100 changes that have accrued along these two lineages, and it has taken 5 million years for all those changes to accrue, then your rate is 20 changes per million years. Right? Um, now, this need not be a fossil record. It could also be a geological event. Uh, such as formation of a mountain range uh, that has split the geographic range of these two species, um, or rather these two populations, you know, initiating a process of speciation at this point in time. And then, you know, you use the same logic. So once we have this rate, we can then use this rate, apply it onto other parts of the tree, and we can then um, date other nodes. So that's the whole idea of molecular dating. Uh, it's actually very, very, very simple. Uh, in fact, one can do this uh, by hand, you know. So here's an example of, you know, when we use a, a geological event such as formation of a mountain range um, to calibrate the molecular clock. All right. So what do we do then? So let's once we know the the rate of molecular evolution, as, as I said, then when one can determine what are the ages of all these nodes here, which represents the the divergence between lineages. For example, uh, from our earlier ex exercise, we notice uh, we came up with the rate of 20 changes per million years so let's assume that this is the the rate of molecular evolution and what you see here is pairwise uh, sequence difference among you know various primate species uh, and between say chimpanzee and gorilla is 120 uh, well, 123 is between human and chimpanzee, right? Uh, and you 
we know the rate is 20 changes per species per per million years. Um, if you just now divide these uh, this this sequence difference by 20, that will give you the the date when these two species diverge from each other. Okay, um, so this is how uh, we determine when species diverge from each other. So obviously you need the time information and that time information comes from fossil data and also from uh, you know geological records if you know of um, uh, any geological event that might have resulted in speciation. Okay, uh, so that is uh, that's how you would calibrate the molecular clock. Uh, one can uh, so the model the the modern uh, you know the molecular dating methods. One can well, I guess someone's uh, mic is on. Could you mute yourself? I just I just muted. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so one can, uh, so many of the modern uh, sort of molecular dating tools, one can use multiple calibrations and it is always advisable to use multiple calibrations. Uh, maybe some of them are geological dates, some of them are fossil dates. So maybe you know, you know, you have a fossil for, for human chimp divergence and there is some geological date for the divergence between, you know, baboon and, and Langur, so this would be uh, uh, colobenes and sarcopithecines. Um, so one should ideally use multiple fossil calibrations, and the program will then come up with a rate that it can apply on the whole tree. Right, um, and sometimes these dates might not be consistent with each other, and that's when the program says, you know, I can't run this, and then you might have to drop some of these calibrations. Okay, so um, there are issues with uh, uh, with uh, molecular dating. The main issue with molecular dating is the assumption of molecular clock. So I started the whole presentation saying that, oh, you know, there is this beautiful thing called molecular clock, which assumes that the rate of sequence evolution across lineages is the same, right? But we know that is not true. Uh, and uh, we also know, for example, we know that, uh, you know, there's one tree building method that actually assumes molecular clock. We discussed this in the, the earlier um, uh, workshop, uh, and that's uh, UPGMA, right? And in fact, PGMA gives us a messed up tree very often because it assumes molecular clock. And UPGMA would actually give us a tree like this, right? Where all the species are lined up, they are at the same distance from the root. And each species has, has accrued the same number of changes since the common ancestor. Right now, um, the t amount of time that has elapsed since these species evolved from the common ancestor is the same, obviously. However, the rate at which any particular gene has accrued changes along different lineages is often very different. And the more realistic picture is that. Uh, in fact, all of the tree building methods, when you look at the phylogram, it looks something like this, where each uh, species at is, is at slightly different distance from the root. Uh, along certain lineages, there's, there are more changes. Uh, uh, along certain line, uh, other lineages, there are less number of changes. Um, and uh, therefore, the, uh, the assumption of a strict clock is highly unrealistic. Uh, and in fact, if you build trees using strict clocks, as in UPGMA, you will get the wrong tree. So um, what do we do under a situation like this? 
right? When we know that the uh, strict clock is unrealistic. So people have been looking at various ways to get around this uh, problem. Uh, rates of molecular evolution vary across, across lineages. So at first they started using something called local clocks. So certain parts of the tree, there would be one clock rate and certain other, part, uh, other parts of the tree, there would be uh, another uh, rate. Um, but now most of the programs are are quite advanced, and it it um, uh, they um, implement something called relaxed clock that allows for you know rates to vary across lineages. It basically takes it takes into consideration rate variation across different lineages while estimating the ages of these nodes. Okay, uh, so we will be using a relaxed clock. Uh, when we uh, do the molecular dating today. Okay, so I just wanted to point out that, you know, strict clock is, uh, but by and large, most genes evolve in a clock-like fashion, but not like this. Uh, they are all somewhat lined up. Uh, and this is the other extreme where each one is like, you know, at a very uh, different distance from the root. Um, this is other extreme, but most genes, you know, they sort of line up. So it's not exactly a strict clock, but it is it is close to uh, a, a nice clock. So one can use those genes uh, to date the molecular clock. Of course, one should not be using genes. Clearly, one should not be using genes that are evolving at different rates, you know, very different rates along different lineages for doing your uh, for for. Uh, uh, estimating the 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 ages of all the different nodes. Okay, uh, so I'll just quickly go over uh, uh, a very important uh, issue uh, or a very important point in uh, molecular dating, and that is calibration. Right, as I mentioned right in the beginning, uh, you need the time information. You have the sequence divergence in information. Uh -huh. Praveen, yeah. can I yeah. interrupt you and ask a question? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, how do you read the uh, upper tree where you have used relaxed clock where you know the uh, species are not aligned exactly? Oh no. Okay. So this is this is not a this is not a dated phylogeny. Okay. This is just a phylogeny. This is just a phylogeny, okay? okay? And this is the same phylogeny that has been uh, constructed using UPGMA. So these are not, uh, you know, uh, time trees. Okay, okay. So yes. when you actually get the, 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 the time tree, this tree will look more like that. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right. So as I as I mentioned that uh, we have information about sequence divergence, pairwise sequence divergence, uh, and we get the time component for some of these uh, nodes from uh, fossil data or geological data. You then have to place that time information onto the tree so that the molecular clock can be calibrated, right? And uh, that is how, I mean, that's that's a very important step. And uh, I'll spend some time uh, explaining to you that uh, very crucial step because that's going to really then tell you, you know, what are the ages of all the other nodes. If you don't do this part properly, then, you know, your dates will be very messed up. Um, okay, so there are different kinds of calibrations. One is point calibration, which is what I showed you earlier. You have a fossil that you know is the ancestor uh, of extant species. And you say that, OK, this particular uh, node ages 5 million years or 7 million years or whatever. And now you tell the program, please calculate the ages based on this, please calculate the ages for all the other nodes. Um, and uh, But then point calibration, 
well, I'll come to this in a, in a moment. Um, now, fossil calibration has one issue, and that is the date is never really as tight as, you know, 7 million years or 5 million years. Usually, the paleontologist will give you a time window. You know, they might say, okay, it's late Miocene. Uh, and the late Miocene is 11 million, million years ago to 5 million years ago. So the, the calibration is more like that, you know. Fortunately, most programs have, uh, have a way to accommodate this, uh, this range while they calibrate the molecular clock. Okay. Um, but point, uh, point calibration is unrealistic because we do not know how the ancestor. We have no way of knowing what the common ancestor of human and chimp look like. Right? So when we find a, a fossil, uh, if we knew exactly what, it, uh, what the ancestor looked like, then we can place it exactly at that node. But we don't know that. Right? Usually, the fossil looks, uh, it either falls on the lineage leading to humans, or it falls on the, say, on the lineage leading to chimps. So there have been many fossils that have been um, uh, recovered uh, that people have found uh, on the, the hominid lineage, the lineage leading to humans. <clears throat> uh, because it has more human-like characteristics than chimps, right? Uh, we really don't know what was this ancestor like one can say oh maybe it was a complete sort of hybrid between human and chimp but that that need not be the case uh, it might be more uh, it might have characteristics more of the apes than humans um, so it's it's very difficult to figure out an exact fossil for the node in most cases right well pretty much in every case what you can do though is you can find fossils along a particular lineage. So you might find something that uh, is more human-like than you would say that, oh, this fossil is closer to the tip. Uh, but if it has uh, uh, characteristics that are, uh, you know, it has lots of human characteristics, but also has some characteristics that uh, it shares with chimps, then that fossil lies closer to the node, right? Um, so that is usually the case in, in, in most of the fossil calibrations. Uh, you know that it falls somewhere along one of the lineages. You don't know exactly if it falls at the node or not. So how do we accommodate that? Right. So there are two issues here. One is the date of the, the fossil itself. Uh, it's never a single date. And secondly, you are not able to place the fossil exactly at a particular node. It's usually um, in one of the lineages that are descending from the node. Right. Um, so that's where you know uh, you need to use uh, 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 distributions prior distributions uh, to to calibrate the molecular clock uh, and i'll go over these distributions uh, one by one uh, so the program that we use uh, is is a bayesian uh, it uses bayesian inference so that's why it's called prior distribution so you're using uh, uh, prior information to come up with the more informed uh, posterior uh, age for the nodes. Uh, so these are the four distributions one can use, uh, uniform, normal, exponential, and log normal. OK, what is uniform distribution? <clears throat> so uniform distribution is nice when you uh, do not have exact uh, date for a particular fossil, right? Uh, for example, in this particular case, the age is between 11 to 5 million years ago. Uh, so this node could be anywhere between 11 to 5 million years ago, right? So it has a, a maximum age and a minimum age. 
uh, and uh, the program will then pick ages within this range to calibrate um, the rest of the ages for the rest of the node. And for the rest of the nodes, it will give you a range again, because you know it has to incorporate this range. Um, Again, you know, as I said, uh, point calibration <clears throat> is not a good idea for fossil because you know we don't know if it really falls there or in any of these uh, uh, lineages. So uniform distribution, uh, where the date can lie anywhere between a certain range, is usually used in case of uh, uh, certain paleogeographic uh, when you are using paleogeographic data. Uh, or geological events to uh, date your your tree, right? Uh, yesterday we uh, uh, Anirudh showed an example of um, the Hawaiian Islands, and uh, the Hawaiian Islands are really young, right? So the oldest of the Hawaiian Islands, I believe, is uh, you know around five million years. It, uh, it arose five million years ago. Uh, and if you know that, you know, there is, there's a certain species that has colonized Hawaii from the mainland, um, you know that this date, this divergence here can't be older than 5 million years, right? Because before 5 million years, the island did not exist. So the, <clears throat> the upper bound in that case would be 5 million years the lower bound could be yesterday right the species might have arrived yesterday so the lower bound you'll have to do some thinking and figure out you know where you want to put the lower bound um and you know maybe look at other um, lines of evidence to try and figure out uh, what the lower bound to use so the uniform distribution can be used in situations like this uh, you know to calibrate the molecular clock and the program will then sample from throughout this range and calibrate the other uh, 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 yeah and basically not calibrate uh, and estimate uh, or rather infer the ages of the other nodes okay so that's uh, uniform distribution uh, normal distribution um, so normal distribution is usually, uh, you know, again used when you have a range uh, for a particular uh, node. Uh, you want you want to use a particular node to calibrate uh, your uh, your tree, uh, and uh, this is this is a point calibration. Um, the earlier example is also a point calibration because you are actually placing the um, the time information exactly at a node. Uh, normal distribution usually is used uh, is useful when you are using um, uh, uh, what we call secondary calibrations. That is, from another study, you have an information, uh, uh, maybe a larger phylogeny of primates, for example. Uh, someone has done uh, the molecular dating. And in that, uh, you know that human and chimp diverged from each other five million years ago, and there is a range that they have provided. Uh, and the average is five million years. Uh, and you are using, uh, you would like to use that date. So then it becomes a secondary calibration. Uh, that date to calibrate your tree, uh, and your tree is a subset of you know the larger so your tree is probably just ape and apes and humans right and so you take the date from this other uh, phylogeny and you calibrate uh, your tree uh, using um, information from the other uh, study so this becomes a secondary calibration and usually that's when you use a normal distribution there's an there's a range and there's uh, a mean uh, and this is also a point calibration okay uh, one can also use it for uh, for for geological events if you know that the you know two species separated from each other um, uh, 
five million years ago, uh, you know, somewhere between seven to three million years ago. So that becomes your like upper bound and lower bound, and the the the, the distribution peaks at around five. Uh, and now the program is going to sample from here, and it's more likely to sample at five. Okay, um, but usually normal distribution is used for secondary calibration. Okay, and you can also use it for geological events. Uh, <clears throat> for fossils, one uses uh, either exponential or log normal. Okay, as I said that fossils, uh, one cannot use it as a point calibration because we don't know if the fossil actually sits right there. Usually, you know, it's along a particular lineage. Uh, if the fossil, you know, has characteristics of both the lineages, but a little bit more of, of, of this particular lineage, then it is probably very close to the node that you're trying to calibrate. So that is when you know you use you use exponential. And basically exponential distribution would say that you know the fossil, uh, this uh, node cannot be younger than the age of the fossil. Right? Because the fossil is is uh, on the lineage subtending from the node. So the node can't be older than the age of the fossil. Uh, I'm sorry, younger than the age of the fossil. Uh, however, it can be older. Uh, and the exponential distribution then tells the program that, you know what, most likely it is close to 5.8, but you know, it could be slightly older, but the older it gets, the less, less likely. Okay, so that is exponential. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, and then there is uh, another uh, distribution, uh, prior distribution that one can use, and it's called log normal. Uh, this is again useful for fossil. Uh, this is useful when you know your fossil again lies on the lineage leading to a particular species, um, and it is not very close to the the ancestral node. And uh, you are not, uh, <clears throat> you know, certain as to you know where along this lineage it lies, um, but you want to use that fossil to to calibrate this uh, particular node. Um, so then you say that you know this node again cannot be um, younger than the age of the fossil. Um, the ideal age is you know, much older than the age of the fossil, it peaks at a certain time. And then beyond that peak, you know, the possibility of the, the age of the node being older than that, it decreases, right? Now, how do we come up with all this? So <clears throat> you have to do a little bit of reading and, you know, uh, depending on the system that you are uh, working on, first of all, figure out whether we want to place the fossil along a particular branch or not, and then figure out what kind of distribution you want to use, depending on the confidence that you have uh, regarding the exact placement of that fossil along that lineage, right? Whether you want to use exponential or whether you want to use log normal. So, um, so you will have to do some reading. You'll have to maybe talk to paleontologists and you know figure out where it falls. Usually the papers tell you that okay, this lineage uh, uh, is related. I mean, this fossil is related to this particular extant species. Uh, so you know, okay, it it, it falls along this lineage here. <clears throat> but where exactly does it fall? You know, is it over here or over here or over here? Uh, depending on that. Uh, you then decide what is the mean and standard deviation you want to use for your log normal distribution. Okay, and when we do the exercise, this will become clearer. Uh, but you'll have to play around uh, with the with uh, the, the parameters and and figure this out yourself. Um, okay, so those are the four. Uh, <clears throat> uh, prior distributions that we are going to use. Uh, the actual process of uh, molecular dating, as I said, is really very, very simple. You can uh, uh, 
data phylogeny, you know, you can do behind the envelope can calculation. It's not a big deal. You know, if you know that, okay, the one particular fossil probably is very close to a particular node and, you know, the divergence between species subtending from that node is, you know, uh, is, you know, 5% or 10% or whatever. And this fossil is, you know, 10 million years uh, old. And so then, you know, it's 1% sequence divergence per million years. And based on that, you can just calibrate the rest of the, the nodes. So it's as simple as that. However, there is uh, uncertainty with the age of the fossil. And there is the issue of, <clears throat> of uh, uh, the clock not being, you know, strict molecular clock. So these two aspects ha uh, have to be taken into consideration. And that's what uh, many of the programs, uh, they, they account for these uh, <clears throat> uncertainties when they estimate the ages of other nodes based on the information that you have given. Right, so it, they correct for rate variation across lineages and uncertainty in the fossil age, and and placement. By placement, I'm you know the the placement part is also very important. If you place the fossil uh, in in some other uh, node, then obviously you'll get a completely erroneous uh, dating. Uh, but here, uncertainty in placement, I mean, uh, you know, where do you place it? Along, you know that you know it is, uh, it is a it, it is a fossil that can be used to calibrate this particular node. But where do I place it along that lineage? That's what this means. However, if you take this fossil and place it somewhere else, uh, at some other node, then obviously you you will get a completely messed up uh, age. Uh, again, you need to know your system very well the fossils uh, to then figure out, you know, uh, whether you're, you're doing it right or not. Um, okay, so I think that is all I wanted to talk about in case of uh, molecular dating, uh, because the rest is all pretty uh, uh, mathematical. Um, and I, I think uh, there's no need for us to know more than this. I just wanted to give you the theoretical underpinning. Uh, we'll discuss a few other things when we do the, the practicals. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> before I move on to species trees, uh, if there are any questions, uh, let me know. Any questions? Uh, hey, Praveen, I, I had a question. So when you, uh, I think one of the earlier points you mentioned that if you're placing uh, these calibration points at different uh, spots, often they can be a conflict and you might be, you know, the program might yeah. say that uh, there's some conflicting results. Could you tell us where, when that might happen? And is it is it something that happens commonly? Uh, yes, yes, it does. Um, so what happens is, you know, if you look at, say this phylogeny, right? Uh, clearly this divergence is younger than that, right? Now, if you have a fossil uh, and if, if, if you're not placed it properly and you tell the program this node is younger and, uh, and then you have another fossil uh, for this node and that is older than that, uh, then the program is, you know, just going to uh, I don't even know if it gives you an error. It probably does not even run. No. Know? So what really happens if you have two different calibrations that that do not match, uh, then uh, Beast would still run. It would still it would still finish, but the ESS values for those priors won't converge. Uh, so mm -hmm. one, of, one of them will work. Uh, one of them will get over two hundred, which which means that the the phylogeny has been uh, calibrated using that one fossil. And the other one would be way less than 200. Uh, so, yeah, so that's how Beast kind of informs you that the two fossils don't uh, correspond to each other. Okay. Yeah, and often, uh, often one trick is to sort of, if you have multiple fossil calibrations, uh, you sequentially sort of drop uh, one fossil calibration and, um, and, and run the 
uh, analysis again and see if your ess values uh, uh, get better right and uh, that's one way of finding out which fossil calibration is not consistent with the remaining fossils right okay so another possibility here could be that uh, you know your fossils are right but uh, let's say you you picked the wrong genes right and uh, these genes are giving you a com giving you completely different uh, mutation rates now uh, you you would still face the same problem yeah. right so if if you see that yeah. the areas where your fossils are not converging it could be one of the following it could be either the either that the fossils don't uh, kind of uh, uh, corroborate with each other or it could just be that you're using you know uh, the wrong data set for the analysis does it make sense yes yes thank you yeah yeah and uh, just to uh, add to the you know uh, what chaitanya pointed out uh, this is particularly particularly true in case of uh, nuclear and mitochondrial data set if you are combining them uh, we know that mitochondrial markers evolve rapidly and if you are going to use that for fossil calibrations um, uh, i mean uh, for for uh, molecular dating then it's a good idea to drop the third position of the mitochondrial gene so that you know the mitochondrial markers are evolving roughly at the same rate as the nuclear markers that you have used right so there there are all these things one has to keep in mind um any other questions uh yeah i had one uh so yeah. pravin what i was uh, what i was thinking is uh, we talked about uh, the fossils for uh, the chimp and the uh, and humans and we uh, yeah. we placed it uh, on the branch which had human so <clears throat> this is just we yeah. are uh, speculating that it may it may uh, fall on that branch just on yeah so so and no, uh, yeah 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 based on morphology yes yeah. we know that so the paleontologist in this case the paleontologists have very clearly said that this is an hominid right so it is something that is on the human lineage so that information you should have uh, sorry i interrupted you so you were uh, what else you wanted to say yeah so uh, so we know that uh, genes might be evolving at a certain rate but it is not uh, it is, we, we are not sure about how the morphology is going to change the morphology the uh, expression of that particular gene into morphology may be different and to tackle this kind of problem we will be using the window thing or the distribution of time which we are using if i'm not wrong yeah yeah well the we use the prior distribution because we're not sure where exactly it falls yeah okay okay yeah correct yeah. i think yeah i'm on the right path then okay okay cool yeah. okay thank you any other question before i move on to species trees okay we can come back to questions uh, a little later uh let me move on to species trees because it's already i realize it is 746 okay all right now um we all have done lot of tree building uh or you know at least uh, most of us um and what we normally do uh, is uh, we have multiple genes we concatenate them right and uh, use uh, uh so basically we combine multiple markers into a single large data set and build a phylogeny right so that is what we get right so you will have a couple of nuclear genes you'll have a mitochondrial gene you put it all together and you get your tree however uh when you look at the individual gene trees so if you build trees based on the individual markers often they might be different and that is because uh, you know the individual gene trees might uh, have different evolutionary histories um and this happens because often gene divergence predates species divergence and this is something people we call deep coalescence and i'll just explain that in a in a minute now when you concatenate all the markers together um it is assuming that all the genes are evolving in this uh, are all the genes that you have used have the same evolutionary history 
So if they have the same evolutionary history, one can concatenate. However, as I said, increasingly people are realizing that you know uh, the gene trees can be quite different from each other. And at that point in time, it's not a good idea to put them all together. We then have to use something called the species tree approach. Okay, this, this is a whole new uh, uh, class of tree building methods that have emerged in the last 10 years. So in the earlier uh, uh, workshop, we talked about the different tree building methods. Those are all for concatenated data set, right? Uh, but if you, uh, but before you concatenate them, one should build gene trees. Uh, that is for individual markers, build separate trees. And if these trees are, are by and large similar, you can concatenate them. But if they are different, then uh, it clearly each gene has a different evolutionary history. Then we have to use species tree approach. Okay. Now, species tree is technically a phylogeny. It's, it's, it's actually a phylogeny, but when we say phylogeny, because of history, uh, we usually mean con concatenated data set. And when we say species tree, it usually means that, you know, each uh, gene has uh, the, the, uh, the gene genealogy of each gene has been estimated separately. And then we, have, we, have, we are sort of combining it to get to the phylogeny. And that's why, you know, it's, it's given a different term called species trees. Okay. Now, why does this, why is this important? Uh, <clears throat> so here is a, uh, alignment, two different genes, right? And, you know, here are your hypothetical species, A, B, and C, or whatever, uh, how many other species there are. And, um, so that's, that's gene one and that's gene two. So gene one gives you a tree like so. Gene two gives you a tree that looks like this. But when you combine it, you get uh, a phylogeny that is, that is looking like this, right? And that is what we normally do. We combine them, we get a particular phylogeny and we are happy. Um, but you should look at the individual gene trees. Uh, and if they are different, combining them is not a good idea. And uh, often combining them, what it does is the phylogeny is skewed towards the marker that has more information. Okay, in this case, the red marker, uh, the red gene has more information. So the phylogeny is now, you know, skewed towards this particular gene tree. But why is this discordance between markers? <clears throat> Um, this often happens when you have multiple speciation events uh, that occur close to uh, close in in time. Okay, so here is an example of you know there's a speciation event here, one leading to species C, the other leading to the common ancestor of species A and B, and immediately after that, there's another speciation event, right? So we call this internodal time, time between this speciation event and this speciation event. If the internodal time is, is large, uh, then usually we don't have this kind of an issue. But if the internodal time is very short, in, in other words, in a very short period of time, multiple species have evolved, right? Then individual gene trees can give you different topologies. And that happens because of something called uh, deep coalescence or, or incomplete lineage sorting. And these are pretty much the same uh, concept, but, you know, uh, it depends on from which side you're looking at. Uh, are you going down this way or are you are you going from the tip to the root? Um, so tip to the root would be deep coalescence from the root to the tip would be incomplete linear sorting. But anyway, uh, what does this mean? Okay, now um, you have the, the gray sort of, uh, you know, uh, region here, the gray tree represents the actual phylogeny, actual species phylogeny, right? Species tree. And uh, the line here represents the gene genealogy, the gene phylogeny, okay? 
So in this particular case, the gene phylogeny is concordant with the species phylogeny. Okay, so basically the ancestor here had uh, three alleles for this particular gene. Allele X1 is closely related to allele X2, uh, followed by allele X3, and X1 lands up in A, X2 in B, and X3 in C, uh, and the gene tree is perfectly concordant with the species tree in this particular gene, right? Whereas uh, here what has happened is this ancestor again has, uh, has a lot of variation. So, uh, I mean, actually here the ancestor didn't have uh, multiple alleles. The alleles arose uh, with speciation event, okay? But when the two speciation events are very close, you can also have a situation where the ancestor has multiple alleles. So the an ancestor here has three alleles, one, two and three alleles for this particular gene, right? And this is the relationship between those alleles. And because these speciation events have occurred very close in time, these alleles have randomly sorted in the daughter species. So when you use this particular gene, it's actually giving you the relationships between these alleles rather than between these species. Okay, and therefore it is not uh, concordant with the species tree. So what has happened here, the um, gene divergence has preceded species divergence. Here the gene divergence is, is tracking species divergence. Here the, the gene divergence has happened earlier and you have multiple alleles. And these alleles have randomly sorted in the daughter species and the gene phylogeny is actually just telling you how those alleles are related to each other rather than how the species are. Um, so this can be a problem. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so you can have a situation where, you know, you're using three different genes and in all of them, you're getting different uh, phylogenies. Uh, so what the, the, the modern, uh, the, the new class of tree building methods do is they try to pick a tree that, uh, that reduces deep coalescent events, right? Um, so this is basically deep coalescence because these two alleles are not coalescing right here at the common ancestor of A and B, but they are coalescing further back. So the gene divergence has preceded species divergence. So that's why we call it deep coalescence. So the methods, some of the modern methods now, uh, pick when you give it many different genes, it actually comes up with a phylogeny where those deep coalescent events is reduced, right? So here, in the, here is an example of three different uh, gene trees. So you have used three different genes and when you build individual trees, you realize that they are quite different, but there are certain common elements. Uh, for example, species D is sister to ABC, ABC in both of these genes. Whereas here, A is sister to the rest. Uh, BC are sister in two of these trees, but here it's not, right? So the coalescent based tree building methods that we'll use to, one of them we'll use today, uh, comes up with a phylogeny that reduces deep coalescent events and comes up with a phylogeny like so, uh, wherein, you know, B is sister to ABC, and B, C are sister to each other, followed by A, right? And we call this a species tree because it is not a, 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 a tree based on concatenated data set. So in that sense, it is not, you know, phylogeny in the traditional sense or the older sense of the word, but, you know, species trees are also phylogenies. Um, yeah, so we'll be using a program called StarBeast uh, and if we have time, I'll, I'll show you SVD Quartet. 
uh, that uses coalescent approach, which basically tries to reduce deep coalescence uh, in the in the tree. Uh, it looks at each gene tree separately and then comes up with the with the phylogeny uh, wherein deep coalescent events uh, are reduced. Um, it can these programs can take of course multi locus. Uh, uh, so these are basically multi locus species trees. Uh, uses something called the coalescent approach. Uh, I think uh, um, Chaitanya is going to talk a little bit about coalescent approach uh, on day four, the day after tomorrow. So we'll, we'll have more information on that. Um, so these methods actually use explicit model of lineage sorting, but you know, which is basically a coalescent approach uh, to come up with species tree. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, multi locus data set to estimate a species tree with the least deep coalescent events. So that's what these uh, programs are doing. So, this is a huge, I mean, a whole new class of tree building methods. Um, and there's a lot of debate now going on. Uh, if you read some of the papers where people are talking about coalescent versus concatenated uh, approaches to tree building. Um, Okay, so that was the last slide, but I just wanted to reiterate one point. Um, so if you are, if you if you use concatenated data set, you know we get your traditional phylogeny, uh, coalescent based tree building methods. We call it species tree, and we need to use this method when the individual gene trees are very different from each other, right? Especially if you are combining mitochondrial and nuclear. These are two different classes of markers. Uh, mitochondrial DNA is uh, haploid, maternally inherited, uh, nuclear autosomal is biparentally inherited and is, uh, is diploid. Uh, so I'm talking about mammals here uh, or, or, or tetrapods. So, uh, so we are, you know, these are very different kinds of markers and often, you know, they have different evolutionary histories. So it's not a good idea to combine them. Um, Okay, so that's about you know gene tree, species tree, and species phylogeny. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. <clears throat> any questions? I wanted to know that uh, how do we decide or how do one knows that uh, we need concatenation now and the uh, individual gene tree won't work? Uh, well, so as, as I mentioned that uh, you start with building uh, individual gene trees and if those g individual gene trees are very different, uh, then you, know, you don't con concatenate, you use species tree approach. If they are very similar, then you can combine them. There are methods to figure out if the difference in the tree topology between genes are significantly different or not. One can also use some of those methods, but basically that's what, uh, you know, uh, is what you do. <clears throat> okay, and even when, uh, as you said that the concatenated tree should uh, sort of overlap with the single gene tree, and if it doesn't, then uh, we should not concatenate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then what do we do even uh, when it doesn't overlap with it, and even a single gene tree doesn't give us uh, the information what we want? Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not sure if I understood the second part of the question. Uh, could you repeat it? Uh, yeah. Uh, what I'm asking is, if uh, my single gene tree is not okay. resolved and it's not giving me the information what I want, and it, even after concatenation, uh, the concatenated tree is very different from the single uh, gene tree, then in that case, what do I do? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think you're probably mixing up two issues here. Um, so you, you build a tree using a single gene, and certain nodes are not resolved, right? And then you go on to add another gene to get more information. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, 
Huh. And then you, when you add more, uh, uh, you add another gene, then the phylogeny is very different. So clearly, the second gene is uh, is is uh, uh, is giving you a different phylogeny. So then you should use uh, species tree ap approach. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Praveen, I have a question. Like, uh, if yeah. we use only one method, like. Uh, uh, maximum likelihood. So for comparison yeah. of different genes, we have to use only one method, not two methods or three methods to compare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We use just one method. The individual gene trees, we can use maximum likelihood or, or Bayesian method, yes. And uh, then if those individual gene trees are different, then, you know, uh, if they are the same, then you combine them and continue using the same old methods, maximum likelihood and Bayesian methods. Uh, but if they are different, then we use these uh, methods uh, that we'll talk about today. Um, there's a program called Star Beast, which is actually a Bayesian method, but uh, Bayesian inference. Uh, but it uses something called coalescent-based uh, um, coalescent approach. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, if there are no questions, um, Roy, do you want to get started? Sure, sure. Okay, and then we'll see if we have time, I can quickly show them uh, 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 this one. Oh, what is that? Hmm. SPD quartet. SPD quartet, yeah, yeah, yeah. You uh, want to let's do that right I... now? Um, let's this takes see. a couple of minutes okay okay so let's see okay let's uh, i'll say stop presenting and uh, <clears throat> let me open Okay, I'm not. How do I uh, share my screen? As in your entire screen? Yeah. Oh, I, I, uh, I just say entire screen huh? because yeah, I, yeah. I just see, um, you know, what. Uh, let's wait, wait, wait. Where is it gone? Yes, so you'll have an option called uh, when you click on pleasant present now, you'll get an option called your entire screen. Yeah, but that would just uh, look at this whole thing, right? Okay, let me just say share and see what it does. But that would just uh, show the screen right now. But if I make it now, do you see my computer screen? Yeah. Oh, you guys see the computer screen. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, show you uh, a program called POP, uh, P-A-U-P. Uh, this is uh, one of the oldest uh, uh, programs uh, in the market uh, since early 90s. It does likelihood uh, and uh, uh, parsimony. Uh, it's a cool program, uh, but Roy does not like it. Um, but anyway, uh, people see this window now? The pop window? Program. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Okay, okay. yeah. yeah. Okay, so this uh, this program takes uh, um, the form uh, the file format <clears throat> it uh, accepts is uh, something called Nexus, uh, uh, and in uh, Mega, once you have your alignment, you can export the alignment in Nexus format. There's an option. Okay, so I'm not going to uh, get into that. So I'm just going to assume that you get your Nexus file format. <clears throat> Uh, so I'm just going to open one data set. So you just go to file, um, uh, open, and uh, I've been playing with uh, a data set that my student had gen generated. This is on uh, <clears throat> uh, blind snakes, uh, different blind snakes. And this is the alignment. This is what it looks like. And this is the Nexus file format that I was talking about. 
it says there are 19 taxa number of characters is uh, 2157 uh, DNA type is nucleotide and you know all these other gaps is dash and you know missing data is question mark and all that this data set actually consists of four genes okay and I've not actually partitioned it by gene but anyway there are four genes <clears throat> and uh, uh, one of the uh, so pop does the regular stuff I can you know uh, uh, before I get started I'll have to uh, you know, go down file and execute this uh, uh, this particular uh, file. So pop actually goes through the input file and make sure you know it's it's okay. Uh, everything uh, is fine. There are no issues with the file. So it says you know this in, uh, input file uh, processing is complete. Everything is fine. So you can go ahead with analysis. Uh, so under analysis. You have parsimony, likelihood, distance-based tree building methods like you know UPGMA, neighbor joining, and all that. <clears throat> and you can also get them directly down this uh, 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 pull-down menu. But I'm going to just concentrate on one of the coalescent-based tree building method, SVD quartet. Um, and it's really quite simple. You just pull down that uh, you know was go to analysis, go all the way to SVD quartet. Uh, because my data set is, uh, uh, is not uh, very large, so I can see evaluate, evaluate all possible quartets. So what it does is <clears throat> it picks four taxa at a time uh, and builds a tree. And then the <clears throat> uh, you know does that for all possible four taxa uh, uh, data sets and then puts it all together uh, and I want a multi-species coalescent uh, approach to build my tree and I hit OK and then it spits out a tree so it's as simple as that now uh, if you recall from the earlier uh, the last workshop outgroup is very very important and this tree has not been rooted properly so if the tree is not rooted properly you will get a completely messed up phylogeny. The outgroup here is uh, inductive flops albiceps. So what I have to do is go to trees um, and uh, show trees and say rooting, um, define outgroup. And say that that's my outgroup. Okay. And or you can also do midpoint rooting. And I say show, and now the tree is okay. Albiceps is sister to everything else. So yeah, so this is just you know I wanted to quickly show you uh, Pop. It's um, so what, what, it's one of the few programs that uses uh, uh, coalescent based. Uh, tree building method to get species trees. Uh, so this is this method is called <clears throat> SVD quartet. There is another method called uh, Astral. Uh, there is uh, uh, Star Beast that Roy will talk about. Uh, then there is BPP, um, which Raitanya will talk about uh, day after tomorrow. And there is MPEST. So these are the five species tree uh, approaches uh, that uh, there might be more, but these are the five very popular ones. Um, and um, yeah, I guess uh, that's about it for me. <clears throat> okay, Roy, you wanna take over? Yeah, I'll just do that. Okay. You're going to start with the beast or star beast? I'll start with beast. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Hey, Chetan, uh, so you're around. I'm just going to go grab some uh, uh, tea. Sure, sure. Go for it, Craig. 
Okay, so uh, before I start off with the divergence trading, this is something that I wanted to show you. Uh, so this, uh, so when you generally read a, a paper which describes a fossil, this is how. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, so this is how uh, the fossil would be described. Um, it, they, they, the authors or the author will generally give a certain um, year, uh, a certain uh, period uh, within which the fossil may have been found. So in this case, uh, they found the fossil in a particular rock layer, and that particular rock layer is uh, between Kimmeridgian and Tithonian. Uh, with an age span of about 4 million years. So this is uh, Kimmeridgian and Tithonian. So that would be about 152 to 157 uh, million years ago. So uh, so this is how you get, you kind of get the range of uh, where that fossil uh, should belong to. Uh, of course, there's uh, other issues. Uh, how well the fossil is described, uh, whether it shares synapomorphies, with uh, a clade that you are currently working on. So there are these other issues that you will have to take an informed uh, decision. OK. Um, so what I will do is I'll start with Beast. And for Beast, you need to, uh, so the, the way you should arrange your data set is a Nexus file. Uh, so in this Nexus file, what I have done is a uh, concatenated cytochrome B and uh, RAG1 for a bunch of uh, primates around 11 taxa. Uh, this is something that you should not ideally do, concatenating mitochondrial and uh, nuclear data sets. But uh, this is just for the sake of explanation. So the total... Um, uh, total number of characters are 2217. Uh, so cytochrome B is about 1140, and it's the same data set that, if you remember, we used in the first uh, workshop. And uh, there's uh, the next 101077 base pairs uh, is a partial rag one. And in order to make sure Beast understands uh, that these there are two different genes here uh, and they are partitioned, is uh, so this is the nexus file and right at the end of the nexus file if you can see this so, so i hope everyone can see this uh, this is something that I've, that we've also yeah, we shared can. yeah so we've also shared with uh, uh, you in the google drive so this is uh, just saying that there are two character sets. One is called cytochrome B. The other one is called RAG1. And it also gives the range of the sites uh, for both these data sets. Okay. Uh, so this is one way of uh, inputting data into Beast. Another way that you can potentially uh, load data into Beast is just have your FASTA files. So you remember, you can just get FASTA files from Mega. So if you have multiple FASTA fi files of, for each gene, or for whatever reason that you're working on, you can just have separate FASTA files for those. And you can just select multiple of those. And it will uh, uh, come as one single data set, which includes all these genes. Um, but there usually are problems with uh, with uh, you know, with, with choosing multiple FASTA files, which is why, and I even I faced an issue, so which is why I uh, just made an access file with uh, these two genes. Okay, so I will just uh, load this data in Beast. So I am going to be working on uh, this. Uh, so there are multiple versions of Beast. Um, so I'm I will be working on the uh, Beast version. 2.4.8. Uh, most often, you will see there are some some of the other bugs uh, associated with these uh, programs, but uh, generally they are very minor. Uh, so you should be able to get around it. 
or or you know try to find out which is the best version of beast that works best on your computer okay uh, so what i need to do first uh, in order to make the uh, file uh, which includes all the calibration priors and all the the data set is uh, uh, start executing this file called beauty so there's this file called beauty i execute that and uh, this is how it looks okay and uh, eventually we will be working so there is a template option eventually we we will, we will be working on a star beast but right now we are not working on star beast we are just working on beast so we'll just keep it as uh, the standard default and here on file we will uh, import alignment and navigate to the nexus file which is partitioned and beast has identified it uh, to have two partitions and it's also identified the number of sites there are now uh, what it has done what beast has done is that it assumes uh, is there a question i just heard uh, uh, roy can you uh, try and increase the font size or something is it possible Uh, is it better much better. much better okay all right so uh, so what beast has done is that uh, it's it's loaded two different partitions and uh, it has by default it has unlinked the site models it has unlinked the clock mod clock, clock models and it has unlinked the trees okay so uh, when i say it has unlinked the site models uh, it basically means that the substitution models for both these genes are different okay and uh, therefore uh, it has already unlinked it but if you think that uh, they have very similar uh, substitution models then you should link it and the way you do it is just uh, select both of them and there is this option called link site models that's all so there is also a clock model uh which uh so if it if it has unlinked your clock model it suggests that both these genes have very different evolutionary rates or rather the uh, the clock rates for both these genes are very different okay now if you have uh two mitochondrial genes it is very likely that they'll have very similar clock models because uh, mitochondrial genes are linked uh, because they come from the mitochondrial genome so uh, generally what affects one gene also affects the other one but in this case we have one mitochondrial gene which is cytochrome p and uh, the other one is a nuclear gene which is rag1 okay so uh, we will leave the site model unlinked we will leave the clock model unlinked but we will link the trees because we want one tree which is a combination of uh, both cytochrome b and rag1 we just want one tree wherein we want to perform the divergence stating analysis okay so how do we link it we just uh, select both these partitions so all i've done is just i've selected one of these and i press control plus a so it selects all the partitions and i just want to link these so i click on link trees okay now by default it will just uh, take the name of the first partition and name that tree as such okay so you can change it here if you want you can uh, name it to whatever so uh, let's say you want to name it um, on uh, so you just have to change one of them and the okay. you just have to change one of them and the other one is automatically going to change because these uh, two partitions are linked okay so next we will go to site model we will uh, uh, tip tip dates because that's not uh, required in this particular analysis uh, so we'll go to site model 
and this is where you put your uh, uh, nucleotide substitution model okay so uh, so in this case uh, let's suppose uh, so ideally you should be uh, you should have run your data set in, on partition finder using the beast uh, options or you can use uh, another program such as uh, uh, model test to find out what is the best model of sequence evolution so let's suppose uh, let's just assume that uh, for my uh, gene uh, called cytochrome b the best model of sequence evolution is hky and uh, it's just hky uh, no gamma category no invariant sets and rag1 it is uh, gtr now if you have gtr plus gamma or if you have uh, hky plus gamma then you should uh, put any number above 1 here between 4 uh, and 6 okay so so if you just go through the the lectures on uh, models of sequence evolution you would remember that we talked about uh, different uh, alpha and beta categories so there are multiple categories that uh, can potentially explain your data set so in this case generally uh, what is explained in the mr bayes manual and as well as the book is that if you put a category of 4 and you put it as estimate so let's say i put a category of 4 and i uh, uh, make sure this the estimate option is on it generally does a good job at finding out the the gamma shape parameter and uh, of course if you have let's say a model such as hky plus i plus g and <clears throat> then this option should be one okay. all right so in this case i'm just going to leave it as zero and go ahead and into the clock model okay and i want yeah try can you um, go back to the site model thing Yeah, so there's a very important uh, parameter here called substitution rate, uh, which should always be estimated. Uh, uh, mainly because we are not linking the two uh, site models. Roy, can you go back to the previous uh, uh, the, the partitions tab? Yeah. So here, if you look, we have two dif distinct partitions, right? One partition is a mitochondrial gene, and the second partition is Rag one. Now let's say we we subject this data set to through partition finder or J model test or one of those uh, programs, and we uh, and these programs suggest that for both partitions uh, we have to use let's say HKY as as the model of sequence evolution. Now, what really happens is because it's HKY on both partitions, uh, we can actually link the two sites uh, or or we can actually link the two partitions for. the site models because we are using the same uh, site models and we are probably using the same other parameters however what will happen is when you link the two partitions for uh, for the site model it's going to give you a single substitution rate for both partitions right but now what we are doing is we are keeping the site model unlinked between cytochrome and rag1 basically we are telling beast that calculate substitution rate separately for cytochrome b and separately for rag1 right despite using the same model of sequence evolution so for example if cytochrome b is evolving at 1.5 changes per site per million years and rag1 is evolving at one uh, change per site per million years right if you leave the models unlinked if you if you leave the site models unlinked it will give you two substitution rates it will basically calculate this and tell you that cytochrome b is evolving at 1.5 and rag1 is evolving at 1 right however if you link these two it will give you a single substitution rate which will be an average of these two substitution rates it will just tell you one substitution rate and that's 1.1.25 1. changes per site per million year right so that's something you need to keep in mind before you link site models uh, so it's not as simple as oh just because we are using the same model of sequence evolution let's go and link the site models right so if you 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 still can do that but just the the, the, the problem is you won't get separate substitution rates for each each uh, uh you know partition so i just wanted to add that okay hey, uh, while you're at it uh, maple can you just uh, talk about the automatic set clock rate option also i'll just uh, get into the clock model and uh, then yeah so the so there is this uh, 
you know, this this parameter called automatic set clock rate in Beast, and I don't know why it is always selected. So by default, this is selected, right? So what this uh, does is, it it uh, let's say you have two partitions like what we have, cytochrome B and RAG one, and let's say cytochrome B, you already have a clock rate, right? We assume that clock rate to be 1.5 changes per site per million years. So here in the clock rate parameter, let's say we input that clock rate as 1.5. Okay. Now, if you set automatic, if you click on this, I mean, if you select this automatic set clock rate parameter, it's going to use that same clock rate for all your other partitions. Right. And uh, that is something that we don't want and we don't like. Uh, so this parameter is useful when you have, let's say, all mitochondrial DNA. Uh, let's say you have four partitions and they're all mitochondrial DNA and uh, you're fairly confident that all of them are evolving at the same rate, then you can just use this parameter. But if you're using a, <clears throat> using a data set where you have diverse evolutionary histories, then it's absolutely important to un uh, deselect uh, automatic set clock rate, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so just uh, continuing where Chaitanya uh, has stopped. So right now we have uh, in this in the clock model we have uh, these two partitions right? we have cytochrome b and we have uh, rag one uh, and the automatic set clock rate is by default on right so if i put this off then i will have to set uh, separate clock models for each of these okay so for the clock model I will set a relaxed clock log normal, which allows for uh, independent evolutionary rates along each of the branches, each of the lineages. Okay. okay I, I also forgot to add one thing with that automatic set clock rate or whatever. Uh, the other thing it does is it not only assumes that the clock rate of the first partition is the clock rate for all partitions, which is absurd. It also assumes that all lineages are evolving at the same clock rate, right? So that's another assumption that it makes. Yeah, go on. Raj. Okay, so uh, we've done this. So we've uh, basically set it to um, a relaxed clock log normal, which means that, that we've allowed for independent evolutionary rates across each of the lineages. And that then we get into the priors, the tree priors. So the first, the tree power by default is the Yule model. We'll keep it uh, as the Yule model. So uh, we've provided a book for uh, you guys. Uh, all these options that, uh, I mean, there are a lot of options in, uh, in Beast. So all these options have been explained uh, really well in the book. So please go through it. But uh, the Yule model here, which is, by, which is there by default, is uh, it, it generally assumes that the speciation rate is constant across the whole tree from the root to the tip right which is uh, which i mean given that we are dealing with a uh, mitochondrial uh, and a nuclear gene it is unlikely right but uh, because we've set a relaxed uh, log normal clock it kind of makes up for it okay Alternately, you can have another option called uh, a linear, a, a constant with linear root. Okay, so that is there only in the species tree option. Right? Yeah, that's a coalescent. Uh, okay, uh, so that's a coalescent option. Okay, all right. So here is where you set your um, calibrations. Okay. So Roy, there is an option. Yeah. Uh, thing here. So if you remember what Roy did in the first uh, the partition tab, he left the site model and the clock model unlinked, right? So if you notice the priors here, uh, it it gives you. Uh, so for for the cytochrome B partition, we chose HKY. So there is a certain prior for that, and for RAG one, it it, it calculates. As you know, uh, I think we use GTR, right? So GTR has, uh, you know, it, it calculates five different uh, uh, substitution parameters for GTR. Okay, so that is why it has all these priors because we chose to unlink the sites, and similarly we unlinked the clocks. So you would see these two priors called UCLD mean, which is for cytochrome B, and UCLD mean for RAG1. So this UCLD mean is nothing but the clock rate, uh, 
So the program is now telling us that, look, I'm now going to calculate two different clock rates for these two partitions, right? Now, because we linked the tree, you remember we linked the tree for the two partitions and we called it con tree, right? It is only calculating a single birth rate. Uh, uh, Roy, go back to the priors. Yeah, thanks. So it, it is only calculating a single birth rate for your, your, your you know, consolidated tree between RAG1 and cytochrome B, right? And because we are using a Yule model, the Yule model basically specific, make, basically assumes that there are no extinctions or there are no extinctions represented in your phylogeny at least. And there is only birth or speciation that is happening. So it only has to calculate birth rate. However, if you choose the birth death model, uh, Roy, can you just go to that tab and choose birth death model? So if you choose the birth death model, it will have to it will have to calculate speci uh, speciation rate, which is birth rate, and extinction rate, which is death rate. Right? This is assuming that you have some uh, extinct animals in your phylogeny represented in your phylogeny. But if you don't, then it's you know prudent to just use the Yule model. Right? So that that's what these priors actually mean. You don't have to like really get psyched by it. It all has an explanation. And the manual is pretty decent in explaining at least some of these priors. So. Yeah, so the so generally, uh, like a general question that pops up is, well, what prior do I choose or what model do I choose? Uh, so what the book explains is that uh, you can try out different priors and then uh, check out the results at the end. And we'll uh, and we'll uh, we'll also show you how to actually check the results. Okay, so uh, we are going to add the calibration right now. Uh, so there is an option called add prior. We'll click on that. And what we're going to do is uh, add a calibration uh, for a, a fossil uh, that represents the common ancestor uh, of human and chimp. So we will name it uh, human uh, And uh, here we'll have to specify which are the taxa for uh, which are supposed to be covered uh, in that node. Okay, so we will select Homo sapiens and Pan paniscus, which represent the taxa for which the common ancestor we have fossil data for. And we'll click on OK. Right now, remember that we haven't given a date yet. We haven't given a distribution yet. You remember the distributions that Praveen was talking about. So you give these distributions uh, by clicking here. And so there are multiple options here. Uh, what we will be using is a normal distribution. Okay. And uh, let's assume that the the fossil is. Uh, the, let's keep the mean of the fossil at 6 million years old and uh, if let's uh, keep it between 5 and 7 million years. So for that, you'll have to play around with these numbers. So in the offset, I'm keeping it as 6. Okay. And in the sigma, I'm keeping it as uh, 0 0.5. Okay. So if you realize, uh, I don't know why. Oh, okay, because uh, maybe I increased the font. That is why this is happening. Uh, so your uh, dates are basically between 5.02 to 6.82. So it's pretty much between 5 and 7 million years old. If you want to uh, make sure it is exactly 5, 5.00 to 7.00, we'll just have to play with these numbers. So we'll keep it as this, right? You don't necessarily have to put monophyletic, right? And another thing is that you don't have to specify an outgroup in this. Okay? Uh, it just uh, just finds out which are the more divergent lineages in your, in the data set that you give. Okay, so we'll keep it as this. Yeah. Is, does anyone not understand why we are using? distribution ranges as opposed to just discrete values 
because that's going to be central to what we're going to do the next three days, including today, of course. So if you don't, then we can maybe flag it off and we can spend some time over it. Well, you can also include uh, multiple, like there are different uh, distributions that Praveen was talking about. So for example, uh, you can use something like a log normal. And uh, let's say you want to put an offset of uh, 6 million years. So that would give you a range between 6.23 to 27.2. So it's saying that um, the youngest date is definitely 6.23, but it can get as old as 27.2. Okay? And you can change these numbers. You can uh, figure out these numbers by changing these. So now it's uh, become 38. You can change it to... So it's now it's between six and seventeen million years. Okay. So so uh, uh, you'll obviously do this uh, based on how much confidence you have on the fossil and the characters that uh, are synapomorphic with the uh, the taxa that you have in your pilot. Okay. I hope these uh, distributions are clear. Uh, so there is also the uniform distribution. I think people are a little confused about why we're using distributions. Uh, so, should I go and explain it? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so uh, see here I'm going to assume that we are using a fossil to calibrate this tree, uh, the one that Roy is just kind of putting together. Now, if so, if, if when you go and read a paper uh, that describes a fossil, like the one that Roy showed you, uh, They'll, probably, they, they'll say something like, if you take this fossil as an example, they'll, they'll, they'll say something like, okay, here is a fossil which most likely is 6 million uh, years old. Okay. However, we have we are not 100% sure it's 6 million. We have a range. It's, it's anywhere from 5 to 7. Uh, it's, it's anywhere from 5 to 7 million years ago. But it is most likely 6 million. Right. So how do you account for that range? Right? If it is a discrete value, if, if some paleontologist comes and says, I am 100% sure this fossil is 6 million years old, right? then you can actually do a point calibration and say, okay, this fossil is 6 million years old, I don't care. But when paleontologists and these papers come up with a range, how do you incorporate that range? Right? You have to actually say, okay, this fossil is somewhere between 5 and 7 million years old. right? Now, but is it equally likely that this fossil is 5 million years old, 6 million years old, and 7 million years old? No, it's not. It's most likely 6 million years old, right? So how do you incorporate that, that information? So that is why we use this probability distribution by saying that, okay, there is maybe like a 10% probability that it's 5 million years old. There is an 80% probability that it's 6 million years old. And there is another 10% 10, 10, 10 probability that it's 7 million years old. So that is this graph that you see here, right? This is a probability distribution graph, which basically says that the most likely value, uh, you know, the most likely value for this fossil placement is 6 million Chaitanya, years old. Are you done with that your explanation? Uh, I'm going on. Sorry, Praveen, did you have something to say? Uh, uh, carry on, Chaitanya. Hey, Roy. Uh, yeah, Praveen, uh, Chaitanya was explaining hey, something. Me. Yeah, yeah. Chaitanya, carry on. Okay, so basically we're trying to incorporate the information that this fossil is most likely 6 million years old. I'm basically oversimplifying this whole thing. But just so that you understand uh, why we're using probability distributions uh, to be able to fix the fossils, right? Everyone with me? Yeah, clear. Okay. All right. So, so I will. Uh, okay, let me let me just yeah. uh, add one more. However, if you feel, if you, or if the paleontologist feels that this fossil could be any be any from anywhere between five to seven million years, right? And uh, you know, that's the range and I don't have a specific, uh, I, I can't fix this fossil at any specific date, right? It's anywhere from 5 to 7. So then what would you do? 
you would use something like a uniform prior, right? Where five million years is as likely as six, which is as likely as seven, right? So now I can just show, if you can just change that prior to a uniform prior, we'll show the distribution. So if you change this to a uniform prior, you see it's a straight line. This is not just a box. There is a straight line which says there is a one, there's a probability of one of this fossil being from 5 million years to 7 million years, anywhere in that range. Right? So that's the idea here. So based on how sure we are about the dates, we select these uh, models, right? We select these distribution ranges or the yeah. things, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and also the the uniform prior, which is what uh, Praveen was mentioning earlier. Uh, it's generally a good idea to use these uniform priors for, uh, you know, for example, uh, volcanic islands. Uh, he was giving the example of uh, the Hawaii Islands, or you could take, uh, let's say, the Mauritius Island. So the Mauritius Islands, for example, have uh, um, they originated only four million years ago. So they've been basically there from four million four million years onwards till the present date. Now, if you have a taxa that uh, is endemic to that particular region, uh, to Mauritius Island, it could not have reached Mauritius Island before 4 million years, right? So you, therefore, you can actually put a distribution here, which starts from uh, uh, 4 million years onwards, uh, if, you, if you have included something that is endemic to Mauritius. So this is where these distributions come in. Okay, so uh, we are going to stick to uh, a mean of uh, six million years and a distribution that ranges with uh, between five and seven million years, uh, not seven, six point eight two. Okay, and now we will set up the MCMC analysis, so we can set it up for uh, uh, you know. So this is uh, it's it's not like Mr. Bayes. Mr. Bayes, remember, has two runs each run with four chains so this uh, so beast has only one run and uh, each run has four chains if i remember correctly so let's uh, keep it as uh, 5 million for now and uh, this is all these options are basically how many trees do you want to store in your uh, analysis uh, plus what file name do you want? How many trees do you want to log uh, of, uh, during the analysis? So all these options can be set here. And now once you're done with all this, when you're confident that you've all, uh, you know, you know, you're done with this, you can save this. Uh, so you go to save as and uh, save it as, uh, you know, uh, any file name. dot xml okay so this is the file format that will that that uh, ut can read uh, beast can read uh, so, Roy, just a sec Roy. i just want to show something else also uh, yeah. you can you can actually save this for now i got interrupted because praveen just called me okay okay uh, can you go back to the priors tab so here, if you look at the two UCLD mean parameters, right? Uh, so basically those two are the clock rate parameters. And for the clock rate parameters, what we're doing is we're giving them a uniform prior. And look at the range for the clock rate parameter, right? Uh, the initial value is one, which is fine, but the range is from minus infinity to, to plus infinity. So basically we are telling, uh, we're telling beasts that you go and sample every possible value. Right now, is that even a logical thing to do? Well, it it it, it will still sample. It will still give you a result, but it might just take a very long time to you know converge with clock rates, right? So generally, uh, what a lot of people do is, uh, Roy, can you just go to the uh, uh, drop down on the UCLD mean thing? <clears throat> yeah, choose one by x for both uh, cytochrome and rag one. 
So what we're telling these now is that look for clock rates, just we're, we are using an uninformative prior, basically, right? So we are, we are instructing beast to let clock rate follow the human chimp fossil prior, right? So wherever the human chimp fossil prior lands up in the end, which will most likely be around 6 million years, use that 6 million years to inform the clock rates of these two uh, partitions, right? So cytochrome B will have a different clock rate based on the 6 million year old fossil. Similarly, RAG1 will have a like a different clock rate based on the 6 million year old fossil, right? So this is something you could do so that you avoid you know beast having to sample through minus infinity to plus infinity to find clock rates for your partitions right there's another thing that uh, you could keep in mind only when you're using fossil calibrations or geological calibrations yeah Roy, you can go ahead uh so i just keep it uh, as is and i will just uh, save as <coughs> Uh, remember to save it as uh, XML. Okay, so you don't necessarily have to close this in case you have to make any minor changes. So you can just minimize it. And next, we will uh, execute uh, this file uh, using this program called Beast. Okay. So we'll just uh, double click on it. And this is a window that you that comes up. Uh, so this is where you choose your uh, XML file. <clears throat> okay, so. I've uh, chosen my uh, XML file. I have opened it. Now you can. Uh, uh, so there are other options here. You don't necessarily need to run it. Uh, uh, you don't need to change it. So generally, it will run. Uh, it will include files only wherever your Nexus file, uh, wherever your XML file is kept. Okay. So I'm just going to keep all these default options, and I'm going to click on Run. Dominated with an error. Not sure what happened here. Uh, let me just try it again. Okay, so it started running. Uh, so this is going to take a while. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll just show you a run that is already done. Uh, also wanted to show you this. So 
So this, uh, the link that I've uh, just given you is uh, for this portal called Cyprus. Uh, this just uh, pin drop silence. Can everyone hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Okay, so uh, so th this is for this uh, uh, portal called Cyprus. Uh, so in case you have a laptop uh, or a computer that cannot handle uh, an analysis, or you know, so once you start an analysis, you won't be able to shut it down. Right? Uh, and if you have a lot of taxa, it might go on for a long time. So that's where uh, the Cyprus Science Gateway is really handy. So all you have to do is just make an account here, and you can log in. So I can try and run the same data set right here. Uh, so let me just create a folder. I'll just label it, label it as uh, workshop. OK. So in the workshop, I have two uh, uh, points here. I have uh, a data. And I can just upload my data. And I can just choose my file. I'm just going to choose the XML file that I created. And in the label, I'm just going to uh, write as example or OK, so now how do I run this data set? So to run this data set, I have to go to this option called tasks. OK, so I click on create new task. OK, now here I, I can just type whatever uh, just best describes the you know analysis that I'm able to perform. Uh, I'm going to perform. So I'm just going to say primate example data set. And I will select the input data. So there is only one uh, data file that is there within this folder called workshop. So I'll just select that. That and now it's uh, asking me what kind of analysis I want to do. So what uh, tool do I want to select? So I will select Beast Two on XSEDE, which is uh, basically uh, which basically means that it's run. It's going to run on cloud. So I'll choose Beast Two. Okay, and if I want to set all the parameters, I have to click on this where it says five parameters set. And uh, make sure I know uh, which version of Beast I have created my XML file in. So in, uh, if you remember, I created my XML file in a 2.4.8 version. Uh, so this is something that you will have to play around with. Uh, so generally, analysis on the Cypress portal is really, really quick. So for example, if you take uh, uh, a, a data set that includes 11 taxa, which is what we have, uh, it, and if you want to run, say, 20 million generations, it should get over in uh, half an hour to 45 minutes. And that's how quick it is. So let's put it right now at the default 0.5 hours. Uh, so there's also an option called how many patterns that does your data have. So all you have to do here is just put the total number of sites that you have in your data sets, which is uh, it's 1140 plus 1077, which is 2217 base space. How many partitions does your data have? It has two partitions. Uh, so just, let's just forget about all of this path sampling and all that. Um, there's a random seed value here. We we'll, we'll just keep it as default and click on save parameters. Okay, uh, so we are done. We are all set to uh, run the data set. We just have to click on save and run task. Okay, so now you can do whatever you want with your uh, laptop. You can go watch a movie. You can shut down your laptop. It doesn't work, doesn't really matter because uh, your analysis is running on cloud. And once the analysis is done, uh, Cypress will send you an email. So uh, while registering, you will have to give an email. So it will just give you an email saying your analysis is done, and you can uh, uh, log in and you know check it out. Okay, 
another cool thing that you can do is also also check the status of your run currently so let's say you are uh, running it for a very very long duration uh, let's say you're running it for about uh, 100 million 200 million generations and if you want to check the status the in the uh, the intermediate status you can also do that so there's an option called intermediate results you just go to the list so these are all the status so there's an op there's an option called standard std out so where is that uh, std out.txt so that if you download that that will basically show you how many generations it is running for there is you can also download the log file and through the log file you can know whether you've run it for long enough or not now you can also do that using files that you have run in your laptop so what i'm going to do is uh, i'll just uh, show you how these uh, files look like um, all right so i will use a program called tracer uh, and uh, i hope uh, the people who were there in the first workshop i should definitely remember this so there's this program called tracer and in tracer this is how tracer looks like i open this file And this is the log file that was created after the analysis was done. So if I open this, this is what uh, it looks like. Ideally, uh, if I, so this this is uh, uh, maybe you can't remember, uh, you can't see this. So this is uh, uh, ESS, uh, also stands for effective sample sizes. So your ESS values, all the ESS values here, which are, these are all your parameters. All the ESS values should ideally be over 200. Now, if it is less than 200, it will be flagged as a different color. For example, here, it is uh, flagged by orange color as because it is less than 200. It's about 118 for one of them and 178 for another one. OK, any uh, doubts here? Okay, so you can also look at the trace file, basically how the sampling across the tree space has been done. So uh, this particular graph that you see is basically the posterior probability values of all the trees in the saturation. If you want to just complete, uh, see the complete tree and basically how it uh, increases, you can change it to zero. So this is how uh, the posterior probability values have reached saturation okay uh, so uh, what we were mentioning earlier is that you can potentially try out different priors and uh, find out which one of these priors using which one of these priors will you get an es uh, will you get higher ess values so that's how you would be able to know whether you've corrected we've uh, chosen the right kind of options on yeah, Roy, you can also show them the uh, human gene prior that we added in the in the tracer thing. Damn. Okay, we just closed it. All right. So that's uh, that's it with the uh, beast. So what I will do is uh, I'm. So ideally, I should have uh, run it for longer duration, and. Uh, uh, make sure all the ESS values are above uh, 200. But what I'll do is, uh, what I've done here is just, I, I've actually made a 50% majority rule or a, a maximum clade, clade credibility tree using the trees from the posterior distribution. And uh, let me just do that again. So I use a program called Tree Annotator for this, which uh, comes along with the Beast package. So I click on Tree Annotator. Uh, so in burn-in percentage, let me just uh, burn in the first 25% of the trees, of the total number of trees. And uh, in my target 
tree type, I will keep it as default maximum clade credibility tree. And in my node heights, I want it to show the median heights. Uh, when I say, uh, sorry, the mean heights. Uh, so when I say mean heights, it will basically show me the mean of the age for each node. Okay, so the, for, for every node, there will be a range of age. And uh, for, uh, so when I click on mean heights, it is just by default going to show me the node age as the mean um, age. So here I have to put the input tree file. So I click on choose file and go back to So you will find, you will always find, uh, uh, so when the beast analysis is done, uh, so that the, all the trees will be located in, in one file called uh, whatever file name there is, dot trees. Okay. So I have just selected this and I will open this. And uh, here I've been asked to select the output file. So I can just give any file name I want with dot tree option. So I just say uh, example dot and save it and run it. Okay, we're done. And if I go here, it has created a tree file from the uh, from it's burned the first twenty five percent of the trees as born in and from the posterior distribution it's taken uh, the trees and done a maximum clade credibility tree and this is the dated phylogeny which is an ultrametric tree let me just uh, make sure it's visible Okay, so uh, this is basically time zero and this is uh, how much ever older your root node is. So if you want to make sure you have a scale right here, there is an option here called scale access. So you just have to go there and by default, it generally starts from zero on the left side. So you just have to click on this option called reverse access. Okay. And we don't want to see this scale bar right now. So I'm just going to unclick on scale bar. I'll just increase the font size. Okay. So it's basically saying that this is time zero and the root node is a little more than 25 million years old. Okay. And uh, remember that we had give, we have the fossil prior that we had used was somewhere here. And we had given a normal distribution between five and seven million years old. So it's it's basically taken a value which is between that, okay, and uh, use that rate to cal to uh, calculate the rate of uh, uh, the rate at which the other lineages are involved. Can, can you show the node ages, right? So here you can clearly see that the human, I mean, human chimp split uh, has been assumed to be, you know, 5.8 million years ago, which is pretty much close to six, which is what we set for the, you know, uh, for the, for that calibration. Yeah. And uh, the other thing is uh, you can also see the range. So remember that uh, I've select, I had selected mean heights. So this is basically the mean of the age range for each of these nodes. So if you want to see the complete range, and uh, uh, you, you, if you want to see it as a bar, then uh, there is an option here called node bars. Just click on that. And uh, there's an option called height 95% HPD. Just click on that and you'll get these node bars that represent the range within which you're uh, looking at for each node. Okay, so uh, any doubts here? I guess it, it just uh, it, there's just too much information, but 
know once you uh, once you do it yourself it it will be a uh, more clear okay i'm just going to minimize this and uh, next we will just quickly do a uh, star beast so for star beast we've already uh, chetan has already created uh, an xml file so we'll just load it so once you've created an xml file you can also load it uh so for example here if i want to load an already existing xml file uh, there's an option called load and uh, i'll go back to where the xml file is and open it okay uh chaitanya you want to explain uh, this or should i go to taxon set sets uh well i will like quickly explain it i mean uh, we have three partitions as you can see here uh, i think the first one is nd2 which is a mitochondrial gene the second one is rag1 and the third one is pdc right and because one is mitochondrial and the other two are nuclear i have not linked anything here so all these three partitions are unlinked in terms of site models clocks and trees right so that's the uh, basis yeah you can go on go so sorry can i add quickly one thing yeah, sure yeah ra you may have mentioned it and i missed it but template selecting a template is the most important thing Yeah, yeah. So I I had mentioned it earlier, uh, but because this is already a, 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 I mean, I'm just loading a file here. Yeah. I know. So, so tell them yeah. that yeah, there's a star beast template. Yeah. So there's a star beast template right here, and I, and I had mentioned it uh, when I when we were loading in the Nexus slide. Okay. Um, Ethanya, do you want to talk about this? Sure. So basically, uh, there are the if you look at the taxon sets tab it basically asks you to assign different individuals to a species right so here we are attempting to build a species tree now what i've done is i've kind of we've kind of uh, we have two uh, samples per location as you can see on the left uh, that's the sampling so there's one that says kmtr hyphen 1 kodaikanal 1 kodaikanal 2 and so on so i've assigned each of these to 10 uh, you know putative species names right so kodaikanal 1 and 2 both belong to the same species kodaikanal meghamalai 1 and 2 belong to the same species meghamalai and so on and so forth so basically what i'm doing is i'm organizing my samples in terms of what i think which species they you know putatively belong to so that's what this panel tells you and you can just double click on uh, you know the species population thing and you can change the species name if you want the but the left hand side the taxon that's that's filled up already so it picks up the 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 the, the left hand side part of that table from your nexus file uh, based on the sequences that uh, the sequence names that you have given in your nexus file right so you can use this option uh, so for example uh, here if i just want to you make sure only the first word from these files come here uh i can just use only the first one so i can uh, uh, set that right here okay uh we'll go to site model so there are three partitions and uh, the all the three partitions have been uh, so the first partition is the tn93 and the other two partitions have been given a hky model and uh, we're going to clock model here so we've uh, selected a relaxed uh, clock log normal so basically again we've uh, made sure that we uh, we allow each lineage to evolve at uh, its in independent rate and uh, then we go to multi species coalescence so remember uh, earlier by by default there was this uh, prior called you but here uh, this is in the multi species co uh, coalescent the population function here is linear with constant root so this uh, generally if you don't have much information about the speciation rates in the taxa that you are dealing with uh, it's good it's recommended that you use linear with constant root and it, this also assumes that you have uh, started off with a large ancestral population to begin with 
Yeah, so basically you use the linear with constant root when uh, you don't really know your ancestral uh, population sizes and you're assuming that the population sizes change linearly with time, right? Uh, so that's when you use uh, this particular uh, population function. And these population functions are absolutely essential to be able to build species trees. We'll talk a lot more about species trees on day four. So basically, the, the, the population sizes of each ancestral state determines, you know, uh, relationships, actually, how easy it is for, you know, uh, you know, two alleles to coalesce and all that. I'm not going to get into that, but we'll, but this is an absolutely, absolutely essential parameter for the multi-species coalescence. Okay, so next we go into priors. So remember, we are not doing divergence dating here. So the species, uh, the tree prior, we are keeping it as Yule. Uh, we are not adding any calibration prior right here. And uh, this is going to be running for 10 million generations. And it's, it's it generally happens fairly quick. So we'll just leave it at this. So hey, already, Roy, yeah. Roy, uh, the uh, uh, species prior, uh, there isn't there an option for coalescent uh, uh, yeah under that well yeah, yeah yeah so what about those options yeah because this so aren't we using a so yeah. most of these options except for the yule model the calibrated yule and the birth death all the other options are are more for population genetics kind of uh, uh, work uh, so the birth death model like i think i explained that during the beast thing also the birth death model assumes that there is a speciation and extinction, provided we have some rep uh, extinct representatives in our phylogeny. But the Yule model assumes that there's only speciation happening, just birth is going on, right? So therefore, we choose the Yule model because we don't have any extinction stuff. And uh, yeah, the rest of it is more for population genetics. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, so uh, I'm just going to minimize this. So we've already run this data set. Uh, Anirudh, can I yeah. say something? Uh, in this star based, we are not doing divergence dating, but if one wants to, they can add those priors, right? Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah. you will still have to, so when you, when you do that, you will still have to link the trees. Yes, here. yes, yes. But if one has many individuals of each species, and want to use all of them and multiple markers for divergence dating, they can go to priors here and add a group and a calibration there, right? So right now, because uh, there are, uh, uh, because these trees are unlinked, it's basically huh. saying, uh, so do you want to use a species tree for the divergence dating or do you want to do it in the tree based on partition yes. two or partition one or partition three? Yes. Yeah, but if one wants to, can explore this as an option, is what I wanted to. Okay, so we've already done this uh, analysis, and this is what the species tree looks like. I'm just going to blow it up. Okay, so this this is basically your uh, species tree, which which has taken care of uh, you know deep coalescence. So it's only taking more more younger coalescence into consideration. All right, so that is about it. Any uh, questions? Uh, Roy, I just want to show one more thing. Uh, can I just share my? Uh, uh, yeah, let me just uh, stop my. Screen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, guys, can you see my screen here? Still loading. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to show you the output of uh, a species tree analysis when you run it through Beast. So you remember in Praveen's presentation, he was talking about how you first for, to 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 construct a species tree, you construct separate gene trees, and you try to figure out a way to reduce the deep coalescence 
and come up with a consensus species tree, right? So when you run the species tree analysis, you see that you get separate trees files for the two partitions that we have. This is a different analysis, so don't, don't try and compare it with what we ran. The, the one we ran had three partitions, but in this analysis, I had only two partitions. So you can see that it's built gene trees for both genes separately, and then it's come, and then it's it's also has a whole bunch of species trees that it's it's throwing out, and the consolidated species tree is here, right? So this this consolidated species tree that you see here is the tree that kind of reduces deep coalescence the most and shows you real relationships between uh, you know the organisms that we are building a phylogeny for. So I just wanted to show you how uh, it it builds. Separate hey, uh, Chaitanya, can you also uh, show a cloudogram <clears throat> for this uh, data set? For uh, the trees file? Yeah. Okay, hang on. So there's a program called Density Tree that comes along with, uh, 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 with the, the Beast package, and you can kind of load your trees file, and you'll get a cloudogram. Um, just give me a second; I have to navigate this. So it's still trying to load because it's a huge file. If people have questions, they can start asking questions. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, there's actually I, I wanted to show the tracer output for a little more because there's a lot of information that you can see in tracer. And, and and you know take some informed decisions about how to rerun your analysis or if you're okay with it uh, so hopefully this will load soon and we can uh, i can show you that so there is a question uh, says can you give an example of how extinction would be part of the data set to build the tree you want to take that okay. so let's say you have, let's say you have genetic data for some extinct animal right it, it's more common with uh, you know uh, bacteria and viruses in fact and uh, i think even some mammals and all there is there is a lot of you know yeah now we have across taxa across taxa is it huh? yeah. So yeah, you can you can, if you know the placement of those organisms, you can actually build a phylogeny with the extinct organisms, right? Uh, along with your extant organisms. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just opening a sample. Uh, Beast log file. This is not a species tree run. It's a. a it's not a star beast run. It's a beast run. Um, give me a second. <clears throat> okay, density tree is still opening. It's. it's People, any questions? Please go ahead yeah. and ask. I think my computer is just like, you know, it's run out of uh, RAM. 
I'm just going to try and purge one of these programs and Uh, yes, uh, Shubham, your question is, uh, do we make trees for extant and extinct taxa together? Yes, uh, these are the models which are called fossilized birth death models, where you can incorporate your genetic data along with the fossil morphometry together. And you can do it in beast as well as in uh, rare base. Uh, so just like we uh, place those fossils uh, at a particular place, we had this whole distribution where the, we place the fossils. How do we place this ex extinct taxa? Uh, very similarly, you have to. You also have a morphology uh, matrix, right? For yeah. extinct and extinct. So that will also you can give a likelihood model for that and okay. associate distribution and define the time period that fossil comes from. Okay. Thank you. Guys, please bear with me. I'm uh, struggling to get my computer to behave. So I'm just opening a random uh, beast run. Uh, hopefully it'll load now. Oh yeah, good. So uh, you can see here that, uh, like Roy was explaining, a lot of the priors have not really converged. Sorry, Stephen, it's not up on my screen. Uh, yet. Yeah, maybe you should uh, share your whole screen. Not sure if you've done that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Right. Give me a second. Okay, visible now? Not yet. Yeah. Okay, so like I was mentioning, you can see that a lot of these priors on, on your left hand side, uh, they have not converged here, right? They're, they're all either red or, or yellow in color. Um, so what I want to actually show is that one, you can, these, if you see where I'm highlighting, these are some of the fossil priors that are used right uh hang on so wherever you see mrc at time so there is one called hemi underscore dravido uh, that's a, that's a fossil prior there's another one called diplo uh there is something called gekota and all uh, uh, yeah mrc at time gekota right so all these are fossil priors and you see that uh gekota has converged really well diplo has not converged right this is basically indicative that these two fossils are not compatible with each other in terms of time right and similarly if you look at the mean values here it's basically telling me that the mrca for gekota is 106 million years old so i could have given it a distribution prior just like how we gave it for human and chimp right it, it kind of decided that it was around 5.8 million years ago so here for gekota it's saying it's around 106 million years so you should look at this mean column for each of your priors to see if these these values are actually in order with with what you think they should be right so you can actually use this tracer program to look at your analysis uh, and and kind of do a lot of debugging just based on this right so that is something i wanted to uh, show and here you can clearly see that these two fossils are not compatible because this the ess value here is just 23 which is very low which means that it's not taken the diplo fossil at all into consideration it's only taken uh, this gekota fossil Right. So I just wanted to show you guys that. Uh, hey, Chaitanya, uh, do you also want to show how to compare different runs using base factor? Like, uh, with, with, with tracer. Yeah. Okay. So uh, on tracer, if you if you see, you have this plus and minus uh, buttons over here. So if you want to load, load another log file, you just have to click on plus. Right. And you can load another log file. Right? Yeah, 
yeah, you can load another log file. So now you have, uh, let it load, I think it takes a while. Uh, just to add to what Chaitanya said, one can even look at, remember Praveen and Roy, Chaitanya explained that we can use multiple fossil calibrations, but if it's not really a conflict, but I want to choose the best uh, scheme, I can compare with seven fossil calibrations and five fossil calibration, for example. I can compare those runs using Tracer, and in an analysis, there is a tag called a base factor. So we can actually co compare the likelihood scores of these two runs. Yeah. Okay, I think this is going to take forever to load. And in the interest of time, we should move on. But I can send you screenshots of this later on WhatsApp, right? Yeah, I don't think this is going to load. So I'm going to stop sharing. Roy, you can take over again. Uh, sorry, uh, we are done next. Okay. Jaitanya, you're not able to show the density tree? Uh, let me check once more. Uh, people, please uh, go through the book that uh, we have provided you. Um, I have, uh, I mean, we have not provided you anything. Uh, you have downloaded it yourself on your own accord uh, for all technical purposes. <laughs> Not working. Uh, uh, it's the book. Uh, stop the book. Sharing. Is that the key manual? Sorry. Is that the key manual? The book. Uh, so, uh, so the book is much more exhaustive. It's not just so. The, actually, if you just search on the net, there are quite a few manuals for beast. Okay. Written by various people, but uh, this book is uh, really exhaustive in terms of you know explaining each of the options that are there. Uh, on beast in beast and uh, also it has screenshots and you know takes you through all the different options that are there for a normal run so i think it's definitely worth going through it uh, once sure thanks thanks <clears throat> okay i'm i'm attempting this density tree business again So any other questions in the meantime? So bottom line is you can use beast to do divergent dating. You can you can use star beast to build species trees and you can also use star beast to do a combination of building a species tree which is also dated, right? Uh, so yeah, uh, yeah, and also technically, if you're if you're using beast and you don't use a divergence dating option, and you're, you're not using the species uh, star beast option, you're uh, getting a Bayesian tree. But you know, uh, yeah, but it, it's still ultrametric. Yeah, if you don't use any calibrations, Beast is going to assume that all your partitions are evolving at a clock rate of 1. So your branch lengths will be equal to the number of substitutions, right? So that's how it goes. Uh, another thing that, uh, yeah, while we are waiting, another thing that I should mention is uh, in case you want your outgroups to uh, look a certain way, you know, basically B sisters and all that. Uh, you can also set that as one of the priors. So you can you can set maybe your outgroups to be sisters to each other and uh, make sure it is monophyletic without actually giving it a date. Okay, this is taking forever again. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. Uh, we can wrap it up. Uh, yeah, I, I can send a screen.
Yeah. yeah. So, guys, if there are no questions, then let's uh, wrap it up. Oh, looks like something is appearing now. Yeah, yeah, something is it? Just coming. Yeah, yeah. Hang on. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, uh, Archana, the, the book has already been provided in the Google Drive that was shared with you, so you should be able to get a hold of it. The book is titled, uh, let me check. Titled Alexei J. Drummond. So it's a book by Alexei Drummond and uh, Bukhart. There's only one book that we've provided in the folder. So. Okay, Roy, uh, I think this is just going to take some time. Um, no, forget so, it. Yeah, uh, we'll just uh, yeah, wrap, we'll wrap it up and we can send screenshots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. All right. Uh, so, if there are actually any, if there are any further questions, we can uh, take it on the WhatsApp group. Uh, so, we will see you tomorrow. And tomorrow, Janvi is going to talk about uh, character evolution. All right. Good Thank, night, you guys. Thank, Good you, night, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Praveen. Thank you. Thank you.